Okay, hey guys, my name's Indran. Um, I'm gonna run through upper limb with you guys today. Um, I've got the chat up, so feel free to send any questions through at any point in time. We've got some questions at the end as well. Um, and if you don't wanna send into the group, feel free to um, private message me as well. So what we'll be covering today, the broad anatomy of the upper limbs, the bones, muscles, vasculature, spaces, nerves, your brachial plexus. What I'm not gonna do today is go through each of the muscles in the upper limb. Firstly, at this point in time, um, it's probably a lot less uh, high yield for you guys to learn those specifically. It does help if you've learned them before, but it's more gonna be focused on clinical cases that is gonna be the crux of the exam for you guys. We're gonna go through myotomes and dermatomes, the clinical applications, which is where we're gonna focus a lot of the time on, um, and just some exam style questions as well. So we've got the bones. Um, so you've got your shoulder, so you've got your clavicle and your scapula. And then in the main part of the upper limb, we've got your humerus, ulna, radius, and then you've got your carpals, metacarpals and phalanges. So the real points to take home um, are the two necks. So you've got your anatomical neck and your surgical neck um, and your humerus, your three tuberosities, your deltoid, your greater and your lesser tuberosity and your medial and lateral epicondyles. The ulna, you've got your olecranon. Um, the radius, you've got your radial tuberosity, which is where the biceps insert into. Um, oh, did not mean to do that. Uh, carpal bones, so I've got a mnemonic at the end as well. So the way that I remember the carpal bones is straight line to pinky, here comes the thumb. Um, and that's further explained in that at the end. And that was a lot more useful for clinical skills, um, but it did just, cause you have to go and find each of the carpal bones, but it did just help me remember all of them as well for this. And then your metacarpals and phalanges, they're pretty easy to remember the names of um, because you've just got sort of proximal, distal and um, middle. Um, and just remember that the thumb has two phalanges and that you've got um, them named one to five. So the brachial plexus. So yes, you probably do need to learn this if you haven't already. Um, no, you don't need to learn all the little, um, little subsections of it. So things like your dorsal scapular nerve, the nerve to subclavius, they're not gonna be very important. It's good to be aware that they're there, um, but you don't need to um, memorize all of those. So the things that I've marked an X next to are less important to remember. The things that are important to remember are the the roots, the trunks, how the divisions work, the cords and the branches. And then the ones that are important are your serratus anterior with your long thoracic, latissimus dorsi with your thoracodorsal because that's also in your back. Um, and then the muscles in the uh, rotator cuff. So you get your subscapularis both from your upper and lower subscapula and teres major there. Uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and your suprascapula. And obviously teres minor is gonna come off your auxiliary. Um, so I think the easiest way to learn this is to just draw it out a few times. Um, I learned to draw out sort of just the ghost of it and then mark in the branches um, and mark in everything else. The way that you remember the how they go for me was Roger Taylor drinks cold beer. So roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches. Uh, again, I've got a slide on mnemonics that should help you with the upper limb at the end. Um, so one thing that you guys probably didn't get a full appreciation of not having specimens this year in person is that the cords here are named because of the relation to the auxiliary artery. So when you actually open up um, an arm and you have a look at the auxiliary artery, you have the auxiliary artery running down, you've got your posterior cord behind it. And because it's almost, um, it's turned, so it's traveling inferiorly, your medial cord is going to be to the medial side of that axillary artery and your lateral cord is going to be to the lateral side. So that's different to sort of your trunks where they're coming off the, um, the spinal cord and it is superior, middle, inferior, and they're sort of in the same single plane. Here they're in a couple of different planes and that's where sort of the 3D part of anatomy really comes in um, here. So we're gonna go through each of the branches of the uh, brachial plexus. Now this is important to remember um, because a lot of your questions for upper limb um, are going to be sort of due to uh, with clinical presentations um, and there's likely to be an injury to a nerve and you have to be able to deduce um, 
which of these have been injured. So we'll go through these at the moment and then later on we'll go through um, the actual pathologies relating to um, the nerves themselves. So your muscular cutaneous nerve, so that's C5, C6, C7. The innovation for the sensation is the anterior lateral aspect of the forearm. So I've got a diagram later, but essentially um, if you guys have seen Jeff's uh, mid uh, semester um, at upper limb lecture, he went through the anatomical position. And so your anterior lateral is going to be um, this sort of the outside of your forearm um, when your hands pointing forward, your palms pointing forward. The muscles that it innovates, so it's going to be BBC is the way that I remember it, um, biceps, brachii, brachialis and coracobrachialis. And if we remember that they're all in the anterior compartment of the arm, um, it's really going to help with um, flexion of the at the elbow and also a little bit at the shoulder. And the important thing to remember about the biceps is that it's the main supinator of the uh, of the upper limb. And so we'll find later uh, when we have issues with this nerve, the muscular cutaneous nerve, you end up having waiter's tip position, which is essentially when your arm is overpronated because you lose the supination. One thing to remember with um, when nerves get damaged is if you lose muscle um, to one motion of the limb, um, then you're likely to have the other muscles doing the opposite motion still working. And so that motion is likely to take control if you do it at any stage because those muscles can still contract and there's no um, opposing movement. So the muscular cutaneous nerve pierces your coracobrachialis. Um, and so that's an important point to remember there. So the auxiliary nerve, we've got innovation from C5 and C6. Um, it's going to innovate your regimental patch region. So that's just that uh, part of the shoulder where if you're in the armed forces, you'd wear the flag of um, nation you're from, or you'd wear um, the regiment that you're from as well. Um, the muscles, sorry, the muscles that it's got is your deltoid and your teres minor. Um, and the important thing to remember about your deltoid is it really does a lot of motions. Um, so it's going to be uh, really abducting your upper limb, but also the posterior and uh, suit and anterior parts of it are also going to help with your flexion and extension. The relations to think of with the auxiliary nerve uh, is the surgical neck of the humerus the posterior circumflex artery and the quadrangular space. And again, we'll go over these more in detail later, um, but they're going to be, it's, it's going to be injured if you have a sort of a fracture around that surgical neck, or if you dislocate the um, auxiliary nerve tracking it in the quadrangular space. So here we've got, you've got the posterior and anterior terminal divisions. The divisions of the auxiliary nerve are not really important. The important parts is to remember where it innovates for sensation and the muscles that it has. So your radial nerve. So your radial, radial nerve, um, the innovation is essentially just the posterior medial aspect of the upper limb. Again, there'll be an image that sort of helps you um, picture that a little bit later, but it is important to be able to visualize where um, sensory defects are because it, they could well be in the exam um, it, describing it with words as opposed to describing it um, with your uh, a picture because they don't generally have as many of those. So here you've got the dorsal aspect of the um, lateral three and a half digits. Um, the muscles, it's really the posterior muscles on the upper limb. So you get your posterior muscles in the arm, and then again, the two com posterior compartments in the forearm. Um, and then the relationships, you've got the posterior cord, um, which is where it's coming from, the radial groove, and the lateral epicondyle. Um, so that's where it's going to pass through, uh, pass next to. Um, so, so we got, um, is lateral uh, three and a half digits of thumb, second and middle finger. Yeah, so if you remember when we've got the anatomical position, so I'll just stand up to show you guys a bit better. Your arm's going to be by your side. And so your thumb ends up being lateral and your um, pinky ends up being medial. And so you can remember that because your ulna is going to go on that medial aspect and your radial uh, radius is going to go on that lateral aspect. And so the nerves and arteries are pretty much well-named um, following the bones. 
Um, now, things to note with the radial nerve is that in the posterior compartments, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, um, there's a couple of uh, muscles such as the supinator um, and brachioradialis um, and a conius that you kind of just need to remember. Otherwise, a lot of the muscles in the forearm are pretty self-explanatory. If you have something like extensor digitorum, it's going to extend your digits. And so if you can work, if you can break down those and learn all the little words, you don't have to remember every muscle in the forearm. So um, alternative terminology like anterior, posterior, interosseous nerves. Um, so it is important to know a little bit about the posterior and anterior interosseous nerves um, and just briefly sort of go over it. Uh, where they innovate. To be honest, I can't remember where they innovate. Um, it isn't as high yield as knowing the broad aspects, but if you've got the time to go over it, it, it may come up um, that you have to look at one of those, but you can also kind of work out if you have an understanding of where the muscles are. Um, so there's a lot of anatomy that is sort of just deduction of things. Um, and so having that sort of broad um, aspect can help you with that. So we've got the median nerve. Um, so in some people it has C5, otherwise it's C6 to C1. So the innovation of it is, so it innovates the palmar aspect. So we're looking at the anterior part of the lateral three and a half digits and associated palm. Um, and then the muscles, the anterior forearm muscles, apart from flexor carpi ulnaris, and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. And so they're the two um, nerves, the two muscles that are going to be supplied by the ulnar nerve. And so those are important to work out because you can, um, it'll show up in clinical presentations um, and it'll also be important because you can then say everything else there is going to be invaded by the median nerve. You've got your thena muscles um, and your lateral two lumbricals. Um, and then we're going to talk about the carpal tunnel later as well. Your ulnar nerves that we can see is coming down that medial aspect of the upper limb. So we've got C8 and T1. The innovation is the medial one and a half digits. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys got have been told this, but if you knock your funny bone and you actually think about what's tingling, it's your pinky and it's going to be half of your ring finger. Um, so that's a good way to um, sort of remember that. And I'm not saying to sort of go find something to hit your elbow on, but if you do have the unfortunate circumstance of having that, just have a, have a think about it and feel where that's tingling. Um, the muscles, so the hand, it's the intrinsic muscles of the hand, bar those innervated by the median nerve. Um, so you've got your thena eminence and your lateral two lumbricals. And then you've also got flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. And the relationship is going to be that funny bone posterior to the medial epicondyle. So your dermatomes. So if we have a look here, we've got, um, this is going to be the different nerves and we can see that radial nerve is that medial, um, posterior medial aspect um, and you've got the others there and I'll let you guys look over that in your own time. Um, the important thing to remember with the upper limb germ terms is actually fairly easy. You put your arm out, you go along the top, C4, C5, you take every second finger, C6, 7, 8 and then come back T1, T2. It's the easiest way to learn the germ terms because um, there may be questions on those, but also for clinical skills, which you guys will get a lecture on later, I believe. Um, and that's going to be, you just have to do some of the things in each of the dermatomes. Um, myotomes, again, this is kind of just um, memorization. Um, you just need to sort of have an idea of which uh, movements are going to be affected if you've got a palsy or a lesion in one of the spinal roots. Um, so I'll let, I've got this here. This is straight out of Morin Daly's, I believe. Um, so you guys can have a look at that, but we might keep going to look towards the clinical stuff a bit more later. Your vasculature. There's not actually a lot in the, um, Upper limb, I know lower limb and cardio, there's a lot more vasculature to learn. The important things to note are the subclavian artery um, comes through your brachiocephalic trunk or your aorta, depending on um, the right hand side is going to be your brachiocephalic trunk, left hand side is going to be coming off your aorta. Um, and it goes to that first rib. Um, and then you've got that lateral or inferior border. And then it's the auxiliary nerve till the inferior border of teres minor, um, which, uh, sorry, auxiliary artery. Uh, after 
there to the border of Terry's minor, and then it's the brachial to the cubital fossa. And so your profunda brachii, your deep brachial artery, the same thing, um, that branches off an anastomosis around your elbow. Um, you got your radial and ulna um, arteries coming down and then anastomosing in your superficial and deep palmar arches. With your vasculature for the veins, um, it's not very important. Couple, just a couple of things to remember, your cephalic and basilic are your superficial drainages and your radial and ulna form your brachial veins, um, which is your deep. Just a thing that came up in um, anatomy uh, tutes, uh, I think it was specimens actually in one of the questions for us, is your median cubital is that one that joins your uh, cephalic and your basilic and that's the one that's used if you have blood taken sort of just in there. Um, that's more of kind of just a fun fact, um, but it could also like that's the kind of thing that they could um, easily assess um, as well and it's fairly simple to remember. Muscles. So as I said, it's no need to learn all the origins and insertions. There are some muscles that the origins and insertions are important for. Things like your biceps tendon inserting into your radial tuberosity um, or your deltoid inserting into your deltoid tuberosity. Um, and then just knowing that the extensors and flexors where they go in the forearm, which we'll touch on later. So those are kind of important. The thing about learning origins and insertions is it helps you work out what the muscle does. If you know roughly where the muscle is, you can pretty much work out what it does in the, uh, in the upper limb. It's fairly self-explanatory in the upper limb compared to something like the lower limb or when you get to um, your thorax. So your forearm muscles, fairly self-explanatory. If you break it down, so let's say it's flexor digitorum profundus. So it's going to be your, the flexors of your digits and it's deep because it's got profundus. If it's got brevis in the name, it's a short one. If it's got longus, it's a long one. Um, and they, apart from a couple of the muscles like um, your lumbricals and your um, interossi, which uh, I've got a way of remembering later, um, everything in the forearm pretty much tells you what it does. Supinator supinates, pronator quadratus pronates. Um, something like ab uh, abductor pollicis um, abducts. Like there's, it's good to know those breakdowns so that you can work it out. Um, so you need to know the functions of muscle groups um, related to nerves for pathologies. So that's more where we're going to look at in a sec. Um, and you need to understand the muscles you test in clinical skills. So your brachioradialis, your triceps and your biceps. So that's an, um, important to work out so that you know what um, reflex you're going to be looking for there. So some going through the spaces, your quadrangular space, it's going here. You've got long head of the triceps, humeral shaft, teres mi major, minor and teres major. I wouldn't um, commit these to memory too much, just have an idea of where the quadrangular space is. The more important thing is knowing that the posterior circumflex artery and the auxiliary nerve pass through and they're going to be impinged if you've got a shoulder dislocation and also they pass right near the surgical neck. You've got the triangular interval, a lower triangular space here, and that's going to have your profunda brachii artery and your radial nerve. Um, and again, the borders, they're there if you want to have a look, um, but it's more just about understanding where they are. So this is sort of just before the radial groove. Cubital fossa, um, again, sort of just remember that this is your elbow and then know that your radial nerve, your biceps tendon, brachial artery and median nerve go through that and your brachial artery sort of in there splits into your radial and ulnar arteries. Carpal tunnel. So this one, there are 10 things that go through. 10 seems like a big number. It's actually a lot more simple than that. You've got your four tendons of your flexor digitorum profundus, your four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis, a tendon of your flexor um, palmaris longus, uh, your median nerve, uh, pollicis longus, sorry, um, and then your median nerve. But take note that the palmar cutaneous branch splits before, and we'll come back to the carpal tunnel. So we've got clinical cases. So these are the things that, for me, I felt more like I was actually learning about medicine um, as opposed to sort of just sitting down and learning a whole heap of muscles. So hopefully you guys will also find this a little bit more fun, less dry than just memorizing muscles, nerves, and veins. 
Um, so clavicular fractures. So it's one of the most common fractures in the body. Most commonly it's mid shaft. Um, and FUSH, FUSH is one of my favorite acronyms. Um, so if you guys haven't learned about it, it's full on an outstretched hand. Um, and so um, what we're going to have here is um, you're likely to sort of just fall and depending on the way you fall on your hand, um, you're going to, you could fracture your clavicle. And because of that, you, your arm, your upper limb could drop because your clavicle is really supporting that. Um, and you're going to have muscles pull this side, the medial aspect of the clavicle up and the limb pull the lateral aspect of the clavicle down. And here you've got to worry about your subclavian arteries and the divisions of the brachial plexus. Um, I'm going to get to Guyon's canal. Um, so that's going to come up in the clinical um, cases, but it's the, the, you don't need to remember as much what goes through it. Um, humeral fractures, uh, surgical neck is the most common. So we've got a surgical neck fracture here. Uh, also going to be foosh or a direct blow. Um, children can get a green stick fracture. So that's sort of where it half splits, um, but doesn't actually displace it all. Uh, your surgical neck. So you've got to worry there about your auxiliary nerve and your posterior circumflex artery. Your radial groove, you've got your radial nerve, profunda brachii artery, distal end, you've got to worry about your median nerve. So that's something like a supracondylar fracture and your medial epicondyle, you have to worry about your ulnar nerve. So this stuff is quite important guys, um, because if you've got a presentation of a patient and they say they have a humeral fracture, but don't tell you which one and give you some kind of presentation, you then need to be able to, you could, um, you might need to be able to work out where the fracture is. Colleys fracture. Um, so common in osteoporosis combined with Fouch, uh, it's forced extension of the hand. So that's going to be your hand sort of going back. Um, so if you fall backwards and put your hand down like that, it's um, fracture here of the radius with the distal end moving dorsally. So I remember D to D for Collies. Um, and then it's going to have this dinner fork appearance because you go up and then down and then back up in the hand. Opposite is Smith's fracture. So if you fall on a flex wrist, so it's going to be moving, the distal end is going to be moving proximally. The way I remember this is just to remember Collies and to remember that Smith is just the opposite. Radio ulnar fractures. Um, so your interosseous membrane is going to be between these um, bones and that's going to transmit force. Uh, Montejas is an ulnar fracture with radial head dislocation and Galetzi is a radial fracture with distal ulnar um, dislocation. So that should say proximal radial head, oh, radial head. So that's the proximal part. Um, so the memory tool that I used for this is G is before M, R is before U and D is before P. So if we match those up, G, R and D and M, U and P. So if you just remember what it relates to. So Galetzi is your radius is fracturing and it's the distal part of the ulna that dislocates. And for Montegia, it's your ulna that fractures and it's the proximal part of your radius that dislocates. So it's because of that interosseous membrane that the force is transmitted and you're going to have one fracture and one dislocate. Scaphoid fractures. Um, commonly presents as a sprained wrist, not always picked up on an x-ray. It's the most commonly fractured carpal bone. Um, buzzword here is avascular necrosis, as is it is with the neck of the femur fracture. Um, and that's due to the retrograde blood supplies, so the blood coming from there. So this proximal part of the scaphoid is going to be um, potentially necrosed. Uh, it increases the chance of osteoarthritis and it can need surgery if it's displaced. Winging of the scapula, um, buzzword for uh, long thoracic nerve injury, it's abduction of the arm above 90 degrees is unable to happen. Um, and it's commonly from stab wounds, bullet wounds or mastectomies. Uh, glenohumeral dislocations, so that's just a fancy way of saying dislocation of your shoulder most often anteriorly, um, but then it can be a bit deceiving because the limb drops inferiorly because there's less of that support and your auxiliary nerve is really what's at risk here. Radial head dislocation and subluxation. So subluxation is just an uh, incomplete dislocation. Um, I don't know if you guys ever sort of swung between your parents' hands and stuff, but that is um, a great way to sublux the, your radial head. Um, and it, tears the distal attachment of the annular ligament. Ligaments in your um, joints and stuff for the upper limb, just have a little bit of an idea about them. They're not as important as they are in the knee or in the ankle. 
Uh, okay, so these are the brachial plexus nerve injuries. See, so musculocutaneous nerve injury. It's quite protected in the axilla. Um, so you only really have it with a knife wound. Um, you get paralysis of the three muscles, BBC, that I spoke about. So you're going to have weak flexion of your shoulder and elbow, which is, remember, that's that anterior compartment, and also weak supination of the forearm, um, which is from that biceps and you lose the lat sensation on the lateral surface of your forearm. So it's pretty straightforward if you can remember what they um, do, um, then you can have it sort of going through um, here. Uh, you can sort of uh, extrapolate onto what the outcome is. And again, then you can work backwards. Um, is long thoracic nerve injury primarily due to trauma? Would it be mainly unilateral? I believe so. Um, I might look that up and check that later, um, but I would believe it would be. So if you just injure one side, it would definitely just affect um, psoriasis anterior on one side. Auxiliary nerve injury. Um, so again, we've spoken about surgical neck fractures um, and dislocated shoulders. See so your deltoid anterior, um, sorry, that should be teres minor. Um, you get deltoid anterior minor atrophy, um, difficulty in shoulder abduction. Um, you're going to lose the sensations to the regimental patch area. These first couple of nerves are pretty simple. Um, it's just sort of working out what they do, and then that's what you're going to lose. Radial nerve injury. So this is commonly in the radial groove along that humerus, um, either from fracture in mid shaft fracture or a compression of that. So it presents as wrist drop because you lose your extensors. And again, as we said, if you've lost your extensors, your flexors are still working. So your hand is gonna end up being flexed. Um, and so it's called Saturday night palsy. Essentially, if you get drunk and lie over your chair like that, um, it can potentially impinge that and compress that nerve. The other way is if someone sleeps on your arm, um, that can sometimes happen. Um, so paralysis paralyzes your triceps and posterior muscles in your forearm. The other important thing to note is supinator syndrome. So the radial nerve pierces supinator. Um, and so if you have that, it only results in loss of the deep posterior compartment. So like your um, extension at the elbow is going to be fine. Um, so sensory loss to the posterior part of the limb and the dorsum of the lateral three and a half digits. Median nerve injury, so at the elbow. You can see my shoddy drawing of a median nerve passing through here. Mainly caused by supracondylar fractures of the humerus. Again, in anatomy, a lot of it is just smashing words together. If any of you learnt German, it's essentially like that. It's just taking a whole heap of nouns and putting them together. So if we break this down, supra and condylar. So supra is going to mean essentially above, and condylar refers to the condyle. So it's a fracture above the condyles on the humerus. So you lose your forearm muscles by the median half of flexor digitorum profundus and flexor carpi ulnaris because they're innervated by the ulnar nerve if we think back. So wrist weak inflection and it's going to be adducted um, because your flexor um, carpi ulnaris is working, but there's um, the flexors on the lateral aspect are not going to be working as well. We're going to talk about the hand of benediction later and we're going to clear that up a bit about the that and ulnar claw because I know that was a bit confusing in your um, clean skills lecture uh, tutes. Carpal tunnel syndrome. So important one to note, um, causes so fluid retention, infection or inflammation, essentially sitting at a desk typing all the time. It's overuse of tendons in flame, can inflame them. You can get wasting of the thenar eminences. Again, that's that aspect of the thumb. Um, and there's going, but there's going to be no sensory median nerve loss in the palm. You will get median nerve sensory loss in the lateral three and a half digits but not in the palm because that palmar cutaneous nerve um, pops out before. So if you lose innervation in that palmar region, you know that it's not carpal tunnel syndrome and the, um, the injury is going to be further back. Because if you had a lesion, say, in your median nerve, just in your forearm, you could still have all your forearm muscles working, but it could present as almost carpal tunnel syndrome. The treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome is just decompression if it doesn't improve. Ulnar nerve injury. So Gaines Canal syndrome um, between hook of hamate and I did not finish that. Um, I believe that's the hook of hamate and pisiform. Let me just double check that. Um, where are we? Um, I 
believe it is. Yeah. Um, I will just double check that at, towards the end as well, um, just to make sure. Um, so your sensory loss is going to be in those medial one and a half digits and can create ulnar claw due to the loss of your lumbricals, which are going to be extending those digits. And it's just those medial two lumbricals. Um, and therefore you can't extend your fingers. So it's going to present with flexed um, medial digits. The ulnar paradox is that the loss, if it's the closer to the paw, the worse the claw. So the closer the lesion to the hand is, the worse the ulnar claw is going to be. Now that doesn't fit with a lot of things, which is the further away you are, the more you lose. And so the worse it's going to be. The reason is that the ulnar nerve, as we said, innovates that um, medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. What that does is it flexes those digits. So it moves them back. So if you have that working and your injury is up by the elbow, there's going to still be a bit of flexion. Um, you're going to have um, flexion and the loss of flexion and extension. And so it's more just going to sit there. If it's lost at the wrist, there is going to be flexion. And so it's really going to show that you've lost your extension. So ulnar claw versus hand of benediction. They essentially look the same. The difference is ulnar claw is I can form a fist, but I can't straighten my fingers. Hand of benediction is I present like this. I can straighten my fingers. If I'm asked to form a fist, I can't move um, these three digits. Um, so it's a median nerve injury versus an ulnar nerve injury. Ulnar claw is likely to present on rest because personally, I don't walk around with my hands in fists. I walk around with my hands sort of splayed out. Um, and so it's going to be presenting like this, whereas a hand of benediction can present normally. Hopefully that clears it up. Flick me a message in the chat if that doesn't, and we can come back to it. Epicondylitis. So you've got your lateral epicondylitis and medial epicondylitis, tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Um, extensors, the way I remember it is tennis is a backhand. You never backhand in golf. It's always going forward. Um, and so that flexion is for medial. Um, that's because all your extensor muscles come into that lateral epicondyle and all of your flexor muscles come into your medial epicondyle. And again, it's this idea that overuse can cause inflammation. Other palsies. So you've got Herb's palsy and Klumpka's palsy. Um, so Herb's palsy is that neck separated from the shoulder. It's going to stretch C5 and C6. Um, traumatic births, and you're going to get that weight is tip position here, which we can see. Um, so C5 and C6 is going to be that muscular cutaneous nerve. Um, you're going to lose that supination. So if we have a look, that is pronated there. Klumpka's palsy is the limb being pulled superiorly. So then it's stretching that lower part of the brachial plexus, so C8 and T1. Um, and you're hanging from a tree um, is your typical one for that. And it presents with ulnar claw. Um, memory tip for this one, E comes before K. So E is superior in the spinal roots. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you remember these kind of things. Um, just find something that works for you guys. Um, so then we've got some questions. Hopefully these are similar to the exam and we'll go through these. Um, so if you guys want to have a read and you can flick me the answer in the chat, um, feel free to send it to everyone or um, just flick it through in a DM. Yep, so you've got people saying C, so that's correct. Um, so here what's happened um, is we've got a shoulder dislocation uh, and there's some weakness in his right arm. As we said, that deltoid is going to be doing a fair few movements, but abduction is the main one. Um, so we just got someone wanting to go through ulnar nerve injury leading to the lack of extension. Yep. So the ulnar nerve is going to be looking at the um, the muscles in your hand. So 
you've got your lumbricals, which are really for extension. Um, so you have to remember that you've got your flexor digitorum, um, so you, sorry, extensor digitorum, uh, which is going to be extending um, at your, I believe, I actually need to look this up as to exactly which, um, because I don't want to tell you guys the wrong thing. Um, so extension digitorum is going to extend your fingers at the metacarpophalangeal and your interphalangeal joints. And then your lumbricals are going to um, flex in uh, extend your interphalangeal joints of the fingers. So what we've got there is if you lose those, um, if you lose the lumbricals for those two fingers, you're going to lose some extension. And so you're going to end up with a more flexed position. So that's why it looks like a claw. Conversely, if we were to lose um, flexion, which is what happens in hand of benediction, we can't um, flex the digits. It just so happens that we normally spend our time with them in an extended position. position. Does that clear that up a bit? Cool. Okay, so question two. So Richard, whom we all love, hopefully, uh, unfortunately presents to his GP with lung cancer. Uh, his GP tells him that he has a pancos tumour, which you guys don't really need to know about at the moment, which is an apical lung tumour, so at the top, that pushes superiorly. Which clinical presentation is Richard likely to have presented with? Okay, so we've got some people saying A, A is correct. Um, so the reason here is that uh, essentially what happens in this is we're pushing uh, superiorly. So the inferior part of the brachial plexus is going to be impinged. Um, and so we're going to get on the claw. So if you remember the inferior part is C8, T1. So you're gonna think, what is C8 and T1 doing? And that's an ulnar nerve injury. Uh, it's um, that that's really going to be affecting. Um, so you got another question in anterior shoulder dislocation is the deltoid weak because of the auxiliary nerve damage? Yes. So if we go back um, to question one, uh, so we've dislocated the shoulder and so that's going to impinge the um, auxiliary nerve in the quadrangular space. And so it could um, sever it. Um, and so that's where that happens. Okay, Jade presents to the uh, sorry, the tumour is suppressing the inferior brachial plexus. Yes, that's right. So if the brachial plexus sort of goes down under your clavicles, you'll learn next year that your lungs come up here. And so it's just pushing up there. And anything that sort of presses on nerves and compresses them can impinge those nerves. So question three. So Jade presents the ED after having fallen onto a knife, which was accidentally left in a hall kitchen. Which nerve is most likely to be injured along with its presentation? Okay, so we've got some people saying C here. Um, I have been quite tricky in this question. The answer is actually going to be B. Um, so there's a couple of reasons for this. So if we go through the answers, A is just wrong. You're, you're going to be able to flex your shoulder if you injure your auxiliary nerve. Um, D is ulnar nerve and ulnar claw. Again, that's unlikely from a stab wound. Um, posterior cord, hand of benediction, that's just wrong. Um, so then we come to B and C. And so you're right in saying that if you did injure your muscular cutaneous nerve, you lose sensation over a lateral forearm. Um, and a knife injury is the most common way to injure this. But B is a better answer because it's more likely to happen. So your long thoracic nerve is much more um, 
likely to be injured in an injury because remember your musculocutaneous nerve is quite well protected. Um, and so if you do have a musculocutaneous nerve injury, um, you're also more likely to see a loss of flexion as well and not just that loss of sensation. Um, so you guys are on the right track of thinking for C. It's just important to really read the answers and you're not gonna get a lot of questions that are gonna try and trick you like this. Um, but hopefully that makes sense now as to why it's B. Let me know if it doesn't. Uh, would you be given the location of the wound? Look, you probably would. Um, I tossed up as to whether um, I should put the location in um, and decided against it. The reason being is that we get more of sort of a way to go through it in this case. My point today isn't to give you tick boxes for I can answer all the easy questions. Um, my point today is to try and come and teach you sort of the harder questions because I hope the easier questions you guys will be all right with having sort of gone through this. Okay, question four. Um, Angie falls over and breaks a fall with her hand. This is her x-ray. Which artery is most at risk? Good, we've got lots of people saying E, that's right. So it's your deep brachial artery. So that's gonna be, a, it's a mid shaft fracture. Um, it's gonna be running in that radial groove. Your auxiliary artery um, is gonna be a lot more superior. Brachiocephalic trunk is even more superior. And further to that, this is a left arm. Um, and so you're not actually gonna have your brachial cephalic trunk anywhere near here. Your brachial artery is a lot closer to the surface um, and your posterior cephalic is that surgical neck. Okay, Xavier falls over snowboarding and breaks his clavicle for the third year in a row. And I did have a mate who did this. Um, which part of the brachial plexus is at risk? Yep, again, we've got um, a lot of people saying C. So I didn't actually go over this completely before, but your roots are gonna be um, sort of in that posterior part, just right next to your spinal cord. Your trunks are gonna be as it comes down in that lateral aspect to your neck. Divisions are under that um, uh, clavicle. Your cords are gonna be as it comes along that auxiliary um, artery, and then your branches sort of go from there. Donald is not happy with how the US election turned out and in his attempts to stop the counting of the votes, injures his back. He's found to have a C6, C7 disc herniation. Which nerve is damaged and where is the affected area? Affected area or effective movement. Okay, that's good. We've got some people saying E. Um, so we've got here disc herniation. So the first thing to remember is that um, it's going to be a C7 nerve injury at a C6, C7 disc herniation. Um, the nerve, and then we can go through. And so we can immediately cross out A and B, even though um, they, they may be right for a C6 nerve injury. C7 is weakness in finger abduction. No, that's going to be more T1. Um, numbness of the medial hand. Um, no, so C7, as we said, is going to be in that medial, uh, middle aspect of the hand. Um, and then weakness in elbow extension. That's the right answer there. Um, so difference in presenting um, symptoms between proximal and distal ulnar nerve injuries again. Okay, so if we think about the ulnar nerve, um, it's going to innervate a lot of things in your hand, um, which comes after Guyane's canal, and it's going to innervate um, your flexor uh, carpi ulnaris and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. So that's going to happen in the forearm. So if you injure it at the elbow, everything gets if affected. If you injure it um, at the wrist, um, then everything in your hand is going to be affected. Um, and so 
Um, here you have to think about um, if the things in the muscles in your um, forearm are going to be affected because that's the difference. And so if you do have those affected, um, then you're going to uh, not have any movement in those the fingers really. Um, and if you don't, if it's only at the wrist, then those muscles are going to be working flexing those uh, digits. Um, so disc herniations, they always have two vertebrae. This will happen a lot more in the back lecture, which I think is after the break. Um, so we've got uh, two disc herniations. Um, so we've got uh, C6 and C7 because the disc is between the two spinal, uh, the, uh, the vertebrae. Um, and then why is it C7? Is it always the inferior one? So here is, I actually would have to open my textbook and look um, maybe at the end if I've got time, I'll go through that, but that might be a question more for the back lecture. Uh, difference between claw hand and on the claw. So claw hand and on the claw are the same thing. Um, sorry if I've confused anyone with that. Uh, the difference is on the claw and hand of benediction. And so that hand of benediction is a median nerve injury um, claw hand is um, on the claw. Uh, so the would elbow and axilla injuries, the ulnar nerve present the same? Yes, they essentially would. So if you're injuring the ulnar nerve, it's going to be the same. If you injure it sort of more proximally and you get that um, posterior cord where there's the branches, other um, nerve, uh, sensory part, then they would also be injured. So looking at that brachial plexus diagram, but yes, if you just injure the ulnar nerve, that's going to be the same things that are affected. Um, okay, so we got question seven. Um, so an intern is examining a patient with a neck injury. She wishes to examine the axial line of sensory non-overlap in the upper limb. Approximately this line mainly exists between the dermatomes of C5 and Yeah, D is the right answer. So it does have a little bit of overlap, I think, with T2, but mainly it's going to be um, T1. And we can actually scroll back a bit. Where are we? Here, and we can see, so it's got that overlap with T1, um, mainly on that back. Um, and so, again, this is another um, circumstance where there could possibly be two answers, but D is the better answer. Question eight, a surgeon has finished repairing a long head of bison, biceps tendon injury. Uh, he uses a nerve stimulator to see if the muscle is functioning normally. He should insert the needle into the nerve that usually passes through which of these muscles. Perfect. You guys are right on top of this. It's coracobrachialis. So that's the muscular cutaneous nerve. Um, and so that was really well done by you guys. Question nine, what is the complication of the pathology in this x-ray? Great job again. So you guys have correctly identified that it is uh, a scaphoid fracture just here. Um, and so we're gonna be thinking about avascular necrosis. Jamie is a young baby who has difficulty, difficult delivery. His parents noticed that his left arm appeared to be rotated so that his forearm is pronated and pointed backwards. What is wrong with Jamie? I forgot to change that. Yep, B is herbs palsy. So even if we don't know that it is during delivery, which points us towards that, we also see that he's got that waiter's tip position with his uh, forearm being pronated and pointed backwards. So this is what I mean about um, being able to identify things um, by the words, because you're not going to necessarily get a photo of a baby with a waiter's tip position. You need to be able to work it out through um, the words that are being described. So Sticking with Jamie, which nerve roots have been affected? Yep, 
Yep, good job. So C5 and C6. So if we remember E is before K, so it's going to be um, herbs is your C5 and C6. Final question. Reva had a few too many drinks on Saturday night and falls asleep with her arm draped behind her chair. When she wakes up, she notices that she has wrist drop and numbness over the back of her hand and wrist. Which nerve is affected? Good job. Yep. So it's radial nerve again um, for this one. Um, so it's that Saturday night palsy. It's the numbness over the back of the hand and wrist, which also gives it away. So with anatomy, you're trying to um, find sort of multiple reasonings for why it is that. You don't just want to go, I've seen Saturday night in the question um, because you don't want them to be able to treat you. You want to have a couple of reasons to go through and you do have time, three hours for 100 questions. You do have time for that. So helpful mnemonics, uh, carpal bone, straight line to pinky, here comes the thumb, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. Uh, that's the easiest way I remembered it. So just straight line to pinky, here comes the thumb, back and across. Um, brachial plexus, Roger Taylor drinks cold beer. Um, Mamu is the branches, musculitaneous, auxiliary, radial, median, and ulna. Uh, interossi, so pad, dab. So your palmar adduct and your dorsal abduct. So your palmar interossi are going to do that and your dorsal interossi are going to do that. And then your median nerve innervation, your hand is half loaf, half, half of the lateral lumbricals, opponent's pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and half of flexor pollicis brevis. Um, and so there it's essentially, that's looking at the, um, the thena eminence there. So tips, uh, teach me anatomy. So teach me anatomy was my Bible last year. Um, very good for limbs. I found it a bit less useful for systems. Uh, more and Dally's is very good. A lot of um, these clinical scenarios have essentially come out of more and Dally's. They've got blue boxes. Um, now more and Dally's is accessible through somewhere in a Google drive. Um, if you don't have access to those textbooks, flick me a message. Um, and I will help you with that. Um, and Garten and Hall for your fizz. Your fizz as well next year. Um, you do renal, you do resp. Um, even with your cardio fizz, Garten and Hall is very good. It's more detailed than you need to know. Um, but for me, I find that if I can read it and understand it um, after having learned it, it really helps consolidate. Tally and O'Connor, um, really good for examinations. Have to say, I haven't really used it this year, have not paid any attention to the exams that we've been, clinical exams we've been taught, probably will be using it next year. PSPs, find the good PSPs um, and use them. They're really good. They also, if you go through like last year, if you go to PS Panda, they, NP Sydney P, I think they both had huge question banks um, at the end of the year. Up to date is really good for your ICLs. Um, and so, that you can just look up a lot of things in BMJ. Um, you've got link here for the databases if you guys haven't been shown that, which I hope you would have been. Um, they're all really useful. Now, anatomy this year, I know being online, I also came into the boat of I would come in not having looked at anything um, and I would be having my textbook open, looking things up on the fly. Uh, next year, fingers crossed, you guys will be back in the labs. Um, and you're not allowed to bring your laptop and stuff in there um, or your phone. So you are allowed to bring a textbook, but carrying a textbook around when you're trying to actually look at specimens is a bit gross. Um, so the best tip I can give you is to learn it before. It doesn't actually change the amount of time. You just have to make sure that at the start of the semester, you bring everything essentially week forward, learn it over the weekend before you go into your labs because if you go in there and can consolidate it's really good you want to be the person that is picked as i'm going to go and ask them because every time you teach it to someone it's going to reconsolidate it in your head and you can still you still got the tutors there to um go through uh what anatomy for year two so year two you're going to go through essentially the rest of the body um you go through the entire abdomen um and all the organs in there pelvis as well um quiz your friends so get on a zoom call go to the library do something i one thing we did was i learned upper limb my mate learned lower limb we then quiz yourself even better than that i found the smartest girl in our friendship group and i asked her out it helps um we studied together a lot like that kind of having just the study buddy 
uh, really helps that you can go through bounce ideas off of each other. Google's your friend. It's okay not to know something. I definitely have Google's answers to some of your questions today or just not known. Um, and your tutors are very aware of that, that you don't know everything. Um, it's completely implausible for you to know everything. So just don't, don't be afraid of saying, I don't know, or don't be afraid of looking something up. Um, thoughts of working on the holidays. Um, personally, I didn't. Uh, for some people, that works. Um, I think learning some of your sort of rote learning anatomy is quite good there. Um, but yeah, personally, I've not been a big fan of it. Um, yeah, that's all I've really got on that. You, I, it's you're not going to be at all disadvantaged by doing it. Um, yeah. So any other questions? So we can go back and look over some stuff if you want. Feel free to message me on Facebook after you've got any questions. Um, I'm, I am in the Med 2024 group. Um, so you can look me up in there or just on Facebook. I think I'm the only one with my name there um, or my email. Um, the other thing is Akil has asked me to remind you guys that um, if you stay on, the sponsor has an announcement and a giveaway. Um, yeah, so any questions about today or any questions on anything really med related or just anything? Thanks so much, Indran. That was a really good uh, presentation. Um, all I'll say to everyone is that sponsors should be on in uh, 